Now, everybody want to look at the book cover. This is the cover right here, The Introduction to African Civilizations by John G. Jackson. Introduction by the legendary Dr. John Henry Clark. You know, so you ain't, I'm, I ain't going to stay in the wrong place, you know. So I'm just one of Dr. John G. Clark, you know, one of John Henry Clark's contemporaries, you know what I'm saying? They, you know, they knew each other. They was pretty good friends and stuff like that. Him and Dr. Ben, um, Ivan Van Sertum, with cats like that, you know, they was all friends. But this is the cover right here. In case you want to look at the cover and you ever want to get this book. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's got to end. It, it just got to end. And I'm going to go straight to that chapter. Now, here we go. You know, chapter six, Africa and the Discovery of America. All right. The idea that ancient America was tightly cut off when the rest of the world can no longer be entertained. American scientists and scholars have tried to maintain this position, but now has become unattainable. The late Professor Paul Radin, who was the authority on American culture and American Indian cultures, and he was immediately baffled when he tried to chase the mindless civilization to his Troy, to his horse. Their civilization culture seemed to have arisen suddenly and had disappeared mysteriously in fashion as early as 100 BC. And the hieroglyphic system has already been fully developed. Where and when this hieroglyphic system developed, of that we have not had the remotest idea. The earliest hieroglyphic date is found on a little statuette, and it's not until 200 years later that we found monuments with inscriptions and dates. Then without warning or preparation, we found enormous mounds with elaborate temples built upon them, public squares, stellas, and altars. No excavations ever revealed to us any civilization than the simpler nature of which this elaborate structure that could have been developed. The story of an American Indian, page 76 to 77 by Paul Radin. The solution of the, of the riddle of the origin of early American civilization was attended by Professor Lear Weiner of Harvard University. After many years of research, he published a three volume works, Africa and the Discovery of America. This was followed by another scholarly production, Maya and the Mexican Origins, which was published by the author in 1926. These books was not kindly received by the academic circles. One of Weiner's Harvard colleagues, Professor Herbert Spenden, Jay Spenden, of the Peabody Museum regarded the entire project as a simple miscredit of energy. In an essay on a Pozag versus the Romantic School in Anthropology, Spenden discusses, discusses Weiner's hypotenuse as follows. Professor Weiner solves the riddle of an old American civilization with an Arab Mandingo lexicon and derives everything from importance in the New World from a highly civilized coast of Gambia and Sierra Leone. From the brightest of Africa came the principal American food plants, the Mayan calendar, and the Mexican origin religion. The full splendor of this district archification is demonstrated in several books. One, freshly cut off and oppressed, has 110 color plates and 16 plates in the black and white and variable monument to misguided enthusiasm. It may be added that Professor Weiner swarms his Negro across the Atlantic no less than 50 voyages before Columbus. Culture Diffusion Controversy by L. G. Elliot Smith, Ron K. Malosky, Herbert J. Spenden, and Alexander Golden Weissman. This is, in fact, the first Spanish and Portuguese explorers found a colony of black men on the eastern coast of South Central America in the Yucatan and Nicaragua. Father Roman, one of the earliest Catholic ministries to arrive in the New World, recorded a tribe of black men came from the south and landed in Haiti, and they were armed with a darts of gunning, an alloy of gold, silver and copper and were called black Guyanians. These might have been the Negroes of Alcara mentioned by Peter Mater de or one of other American Negro nations, asserted Peter de Root. And like of which of many we have seen Rafa's account of the ancient black nations of America, such as the Corps of Brazil, the Black Carby of St. Vincent, and in the Gulf of Mexico, the Amancio of Florida, and the dark complexion Californians, who are people of dark-skinned men mentioned in the Keys tradition and by some old Spanish adventures. Such, again, is the tribe of which Balboa saw such represented in his passion to the Isthmus of Darren in the year 1513. It was seen from the expression made by Yusuf Gorm that these were the Negroes, that these were Negroes. History of America Before Columbus, page 306 to seven by Peter Rue. In short, a, scholarly, a short scholarly monograph entitled African Explorers in the New World, Harold G. Lawrence asserts that 
Africans voyage across the Atlantic before the era of Columbus is no recent belief. Scholars have long speculated that great sea and fear nation which sent these ships to America once existed on Africa's west coast. We can possibly state that the Mandingo of Mali and the Songhe empires and possibly other Africans crossed the Atlantic to carry on the trade with the Western Hemisphere Indians and further succeeded in establishing colonies throughout the Americas. African Explorers of the New World, page two. Arab historian Abu Fatah, 1273, to 1332, described the world as a spherical shape and tells a ship that has circumvented the globe. An African scholar, Al Omari, in his work published in Cairo about 1342, tells the mariners of Mali Empire crossing the Atlantic to the New World during the reign of Masa Musa I. We are informed by Basil Davis that Omari, in his 10th chapter of his Melanic Al Asbar, reproduces a story which suggests that Atlantic voyages were made by mariners of West Africa in the time of the Emperor Kanakam Musa of Mali, in which Raleigh states that his predecessor of Kanakai embarked on the Atlantic with 2,000 ships and sailed westward and disappeared. The Lost Cities of Africa, page 47, by Bowser Davis. Alamari claims that he obtained information from Abin Abahab in the quote follows. And the quote follows. I asked Sultan Masun, how does it appear has the power that it come in their hands? I asked Sultan Masun, how the, how, the, how, the, how the power came into his hands? He replied, it comes from a house where the loyalty is transferred by heritage. The monarch who preceded me would not believe it was impossible to discover the limits of the neighboring sea. He wished to know. He persisted in his plans. He caused the equipment of 200 ships and filled them with men and another such that was filled with gold, water, and food for two years. He said to the commanders, do not return till you reach the end of the ocean and when you have exhausted your ore and when you have exhausted your food and your water. They went that way and their absence was long. None came back and their absence continued. Then a single ship returned. When his captain of the adventures in, the, in their news, he replied, so we sailed a long while until we met we seen it was a river with a strong current flowing into the open sea. My ship was last. Others sailed on, but each of them came to the place which I didn't, which they did not come back, nor did they reappear. I do not know what became of them. As for me, I turned when I was, I was and did not enter the current. This is cited by Basil Dazzle Davison in the Lost Cities of Africa, page 47 to 45, excuse me, 74 to 75, excuse me, Lost. Basil Davison regarded Omar Ari narrative as a tall story, perhaps, but we are thinking he is unruly and skeptical. Now we have evidence of African country, Africans contacting America going back at least 3,000 years. And the research of Professor Leo Weiner has convinced us by all doubt that the people of the Mali Empire sent traded expeditions to America and made cultural contributions to the New World in pre Columbian times. In the final chapter's conclusion, Professor Leo Weiner gave us the gist of his three volume work on Africa and discovery of America. We cited briefly some of his conclusion as follows. The presence of the Negroes with their trading masters in America before Columbus, with, with their trading masters in America before Columbus, Columbus is proved by representation of Negroes in America sculpture and design by occurrence of a black nation at Darren in early in the 15th century. But no more specific of Columbus empathetic arrested the Negro traders from Guinea who traffic in gold and island gaining as of precisely the same composition and bearing the same name as frequently referred to by the early writers of Africa. There are special foli from which the Negro traders spread to the two Americas. The eastern part of South America, where the carbs are mentioned, seen to have reached them by them from the West Indies. Another stream, possibly from the same focus, radiated to the north along the roads of the present miles and reached as far as Canada. The chief cultural influence was asserted by the Negro County in Mexico, likely Tiahuacan or Tartalusum, who may have been instrumental in establishing the city of Mexico. From there, the influence pervaded the neighboring tribes and ultimately directly or indirectly reached Peru. That the Negro civilization was carried chiefly by a trader is not only proved by Columbus' specific reference, but also by the presence of an African merchant, the talisman, or the talisman in Mexico, hence the Aztecs and the market, and by the universal of the blue and white shell money from Canada to La Plata. The use of the shells in Peru, Guatemala trade. 
The African penetration in religion and civic life and customs was through into the judge's survival of the Arabic word in a Malik or Sunni form in America, especially among the Caribs and the Aztecs, proceeded almost exclusively from the Mandingos, either from either the ancestor of the present, Mandingos, or a tribe of Sunni language not yet completely separated from the Mandingos affiliates. Africa and Discovery of America, volume 3, page 356, 365 to 66. The year 1861, an important book was published in New York City. It's titled The Historical Development of Europe. The author of the works, Dr. John William Draper, was a scientist and scholarship scholar of considerable reputation. In one passage of the study of the European culture, the author digressed from his main theme and mused philosophically on the sad plight of certain natives of which he called the Dark Continent. He pictures the benign inhabitants of the west coast of Africa as grazing out and on upon the almighty Atlantic void, ocean, vaguely wondering what lies on the other side of it, but not clever enough to build boats and embark on a voyage of exploration. This book of Draper proved quite popular, and in 1876, the publisher Ray issued a revision, a revised edition. Other improvements in this revised edition of the original work was that Professor Draper left out a passage about a purely blind African gazing at the sea and wondering what lay beyond, etc. What caused the distinguished author of the history of intellectual development in Europe to drop the four sad passages, we cannot say with certainty, but we have an idea that sometime between 1861 and 1876, Draper learned that the evidence had been deduced showing that the Africans had inducibly reached the new world in pre-Columbian times. Apparently not willing to admit to making erroneous statements, the author just quietly dropped the dubious, the dubious passions when undertook his revision of the book. The reader of this dissertation has in all probability heard of huge stone heads displaying African types of physiognomy, which have been unearthed in Mexico by several archaeological parties. The first of these stone heads to come to attention of the outside world was found in the wilds of Vera Cruz. It was seen by M.J. Megalar, who published a report in 1869. This Capasa Colossa, as the Mexicans called it, was high buried, but enough to be visible for an occasional observer traveler to notice its Ethiopian features. The presence of the headdress resembling a football helmet. In the early 1938, Dr. Matthew W. Sterling, director of the Bureau of American Anthology and a branch of Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., visited Van Cruz Forest and took a look at the colossal heads. The old monuments near the located near the village of Zapres Torres. And after the preliminary observation, Dr. Stern decided the area was looked promising for a site of archaeological exploration. He returned to Washington and organized an expedition sponsored jointly by the Smithsonian and the National Geographic. The expedition later in the same year retook itself to Trash Trabzism and took to excavating the Great Stone Heads. The heads turned out to be a solid block of basil six feet in height and 17, 18 feet in circumference, with the base attached to the platform of really huge stones. A member of Dr. Sterling's staff noticed that African features of the stone face and thought the headdress resembled the training gear of a pugilist, and then gave the idea that the Karasama under the nickname Joe Lewis, Joe Lewis, as in Joe Lewis the boxer. In exploring the surrounding areas, the expedition found a stone containing a date, they were able to decipher a series of dots and bars, the same type used by the Malays of Yucatan in recording dates of their calendar. The tradition of the date and the terminology of our calendar was found to be November 4th, 291 BC, the oldest true date up to that time yet to be found in the New World. In 1939, Dr. Sterling moved his party to La Venta on the island near the coast of Gulf of Mexico in the state of Tabasco. The stone heads have been spotted in the city in an expedition from Tulane University in 1925, but had not been excavated. Sterling Group is looking for one of the heads, had good luck of finding five. One head has a circumference of 22 feet. Each estimated weighed about 20 or more tons. They show a close resemblance to this Colossa of Zambrata, the Basa Colossa of Zambrales. Another expedition was organized in 1946 by Dr. Sterling. The site chosen for exploration was San Lorenz Plateau, located in the southeastern part of Veracruz. Again, gigantic stone heads were uncovered. This time, there were five of them. On one of the lot was a super giant head, estimated to weigh 30 tons, with a mouth over three feet wide and eyes measured two feet across. This is approximately just the El Rey or the King. 
In Spain in 1967, excuse me, another archaeological party began to work on the San Lawrence site. This group, led by Dr. Michael Cole of Yale University, enjoyed a successful season and remarked a rewarding find such as another huge basal head with typical African features. A reproduction of a particular stone head was featured on the cover of Science Digest for September 1967. These relics dug up by expeditions by Sterling, Cole, and other archaeologists all remains of the ancient Olmec culture. This early civilization flourished in Veracruz, Tabasco, and Chivas, and is the main source of later Mayan, Aztec, and Tolac, and Zobac cultures. It is an interesting and intrusive article concerning the Olmec culture, which we cite the following. The first Olmec artifact to attract archaeologists turned up in a power field in 1902, not far from the Bay of Camchi in the Gulf of Mexico. Sculpted in pale green jaded, it was beautifully carved, fat, bald-headed Indian priest about eight inches high. Undecipherable glyphs were incised on the stomach. Also on the stomach was a Mayan date. The date corresponds to a, um, 980, excuse me, 98 BC well before the known Mayan civilization and in the wrong area of Mexico for the Maya. The long calendar attributed to this time to the Maya is more accurate to calendar than the ones we use today. It begins for unknown reasons in the year 3113 BC. Closely correlated to astronomical observation, it can be read precisely for any day in the year and the immediate purpose to transcribe for the day in terms of our calendar. It is a masterpiece of mathematical and astronomical knowledge. And it was and it was the Omex, not the Mayas, who developed it. Secrets of the People of the Jaguar, in an article by Jean Rene in Science Digest, page eight through nine, September 1967. The Omex was sometimes called the people of the Jaguar because the numerous art of the Jaguar motif is outstanding. And it's believed the Jaguar was worshipped as a god by the Omex. In his authoritative work, the Aztec Man and Tribe. Victor Wolfgang von Hagen devoted a chapter to pre all Aztec cultures in Mexico. His sketches of the Omex were minor precise description. In Aztec mythical history, the Omex is known as the people who live in the direction of the rising sun. In the glyph history of them showing their parallel in wealth and considerable rubber, pitch, jade, chocolate, and bird feathers. We do not know why they call themselves. The Omex derived from, the, from oily rubber, this, their symbol often seen in that the tree of life in the weeping woods. They traded rubber and presumably made rubber balls for use in the game of Tatilin. A talented and mysterious people, they arrived in the early 1000 BC along the Isthmus of Tepe, where the waist of Mexico is slender and level between two oceans. They are particularly centered on the coast of Canazana River Basin on the Gulf Coast. Only in recent times have the great Omex stones have been unearthed by Dr. Matthew Sterling. Trans the posters, he found one colossal head seven feet high, flat nose, and sensibly thick lift. The carving is sensitive and realistic. The style is found among no other people once we have seen will never be seen nor confused in any other. Only now are the Omex structural complexes are coming into focus. They had temple cities erected stone tellers, stone stillers, and to mark the fight of time in the commemoration of important events, the step pyramid the courtyard of Tekeli, the ball game, where all cultures featured in the use. The Aztec, the man of the tribe, page 31 to 32 by Victor Wolfgang von Hagen, revised edition. Among the pioneer ar uh, archaeologists who studied Mayan and remains in Yucatan was Professor Augustus Leon Plan. In 1885, he published a book titled Mayan Archaeology. In this study, he recorded the addition of the ancient Olmec culture, which preceded that of the Toltecs, and the belief that these ancient people had come from the east in ships in order to settle the new world. Had Peon, had Peon had opened his mind, he would conclude that these immigrants had come from Africa. But since he knew little of the African past, he surmised their original home was the lost continent of Atlantis. Columbus had been hailed as discover America, but Columbus himself never succumbed to any delusions. According to Harold G. Lawrence, proof of this is evidenced by the fact Columbus was informed by some man when he stopped at Cape Verde Islands off the coast of Africa that Negroes had been known to set out from the Atlantic Ocean from, from the Atlantic from Guinea coast in canoes loaded with merchandise steering towards the west. And in saying Columbus 
Christopher Columbus was further informed by Indians of how Hispaniola, when he arrived in the West Indies, they had been able to attain gold from black men who had come across the sea from the south and southeast. It also must be added that America Vespucci, whom America is named for, America Vespucci, on his voyage to the Americas, witnessed the same black men in the Atlantic return to Africa. African Explorers in the New World, page six by Harold G. Lawrence. Professor Lena Weiner in 1926 announced that he'd been able to trace the presence of the Africans in America only as far back to the ninth century. Now we know that they were here in the Western Hemisphere at least 3,000 years ago. And the new discoveries are being made by archaeologists. We confidently expect that this date to be pushed back to times more remote. Evidence points to this conclusion has been garnered by Colonel Brigadine, and as the best expressed in his own words. Here though, antinologies imagine that the Negroes appeared in the New World only during our epoch, when they were imported as slaves. But the most recent research demonstrated that they first came to America in a period very remote. I have seen a statue of a Negro in the archaeological collection of Mr. Ernest Franco, Franco in Ecuador. According to the painting of local archaeologists, this statuette is at least 20,000 years old. The autonomous black races in America were neither gradually mixed with the Indian ones. Let me read that again. The autonomous black races in America were either gradually mixed with the Indian ones or became extinct because in very remote time, Negroes or Negroids were very numerous in the New World. Once I had an opportunity for living for a month in Apopelli, a locality in a lonely situation on the equatory forest of French Guiana. There I saw the representatives of the local Negro tribe of the Samakas, which lived by itself and was ruled by its own tree. The Samakas were divided in several clans. Each clan developed a soda coat of arms tattooed on their faces of their members. The opinions of science concerning the original origin of Samakas vary. While some consider these Negroes to be an autonomous American tribe, other things that some makers are none easy, nonetheless than the progeny of ancient slaves imported into South America who deserted their masters in the forests of Guyana. The Samaka's tongue resembled the, uh, the dialect of the African Gold Coast, which situated directly across the Guyana shores. My own view is rather the later hypothesis is wrong. Clearly, it would be difficult to transfer into slavery an entire tribe, and still more difficult for that tribe to escape together with their wives and children. The complement of the slave group is always and usually casual so that a group of slaves composed of representatives of various tribes. Furthermore, Saramaka of today is very kind of Saramakas of today are very kind-hearted people, friendly to whites, and without which would not have been the case if their ancestors had been slaves and subjected to the beast of cruelty of the planters. So I'm inclined to believe that the Saramakas are the last Aboriginal Negro tribe preserved in America. I'm gonna read that one more again. I'm inclined to believe that the Saramacas are the last Aboriginal Negro tribe in America. The most surprising this thing about this tribe is its knowledge of sorcery. Methods inherent perhaps from an unknown and particular culture which flourished on the ground at a very remote epiot. Shadow of Atlantis, page 40 to 41 by Colonel Alexander Brigadine. A Peruvian science decided in 1952 to investigate the truth or the falsity of the original of an old tradition stemming from the period of the Spanish conquest of the Inca Empire. This legend told of colossal stone figures of men and beasts seen by the congresadors on certain mountain plateau. The investigator, Daniel Russo, climbed up to the Machian Plateau in Western Cordillas and hopefully began his search. The plateau was attainable only by one pass and a dubia made by men who were experts in working in stone. A road had been constructed to the plateau. Alongside our road was a wall containing embraces from which the rocks could be propelled by potential invaders. In addition, small forts and observation posts were built overlooking the road. Mr. Rizzo was amazed by what he saw on this lonely plateau. He found a large system of irrigation canals with some descended underground, two dams, and a good state of preservation, and 12 artificial storage lakes. Tombstones were observed, which had been carved in the form of fish, rabbits, toads, and rats. The remains of the Incan in a pre-Incan culture were discovered, the most ancient of which seemed to be African in origin. Mr. Rizzo, seeing the image of animals, animals on a slab stone, made, took some photographies of them. Later, when examining the film, he noticed the figure of a man in the picture. This was puzzling, for the science had not noticed the presence of a man on a stone slab. 
The interesting report of Rizzo's amazing discovery is contained in a recent edition, edition of the Own Track Discovery by a Russian scientific writer, Rudolf Berlaski. He, in speaking of Rizzo's bewilderment, was not able to see the image on the man on the slab and gives the following expectation of just what happened. Quote, he could not understand how he had not noticed it before until he realized he took the photographs and he did not scrutinize the slide carefully because he had done so earlier under a different illumination. The explanation was that the figure of the man can only be seen at different times of the day. The sculptor who knew this made that secret. Rizzo wasted no time in examining other slabs and clips in the plateau at different times of the day and from different angles. What he saw made him gasp with astonishment. Some of the cliffs have been artistically worked and represented mammoth sculptures. For example, a head of a Negro, it was made long before Columbus discovered America. That is to say, long before the first Negro was known to historians brought to the American continent. Camels, that likewise was unknown to America. Elephants, cows, and horses, i.e. animals not known to the animals of America when the Europeans discovered the New World. And this is from On Track Discovery, Series 2, page 157. The reader probably heard about the remains of the ancient mound builders who long ago dwelt in the eastern half of the United States. There is considerable literature on the cultures of the mound builders in the area. By far, by far the best account of these ancient Americas is given by the recent study of Robert Silverberg entitled Mound Builders of Ancient America. It's seen the mound builders flourish around 1000 BC to 1000 AC. Although the period after the middle in the sixth century of our era seems to be one of the decline. Numerous cultures complex stirring up in the Miles area. Among the outstanding being the Crystal River Complex in Florida and the Hyde and the Hopewell groups in Ohio. Researchers Edward V. McMichael of West Virginia's Geological and Economic Survey had led him to conclude that the Olmec culture of America of Mexico had contact with the Mound Builders of the United States. McMichael's views are summarized by Mr. Silver, who writes, Flat top platform mounds are characteristic of southern United States. But the obvious origin of the style in Mexico, they might have thinks that the whole will experiment with the platforms after learning about them in Florida. And their Florida tutors, the Crystal River people, who are in direct contact with the Mexican civilization centered in Veracruz. Michael Field, McMichaels feels that the traders or even the colonists traveled in large canoes across the Gulf of Mexico in the northern Veracruz in the northwest coast of Florida, and that the ideas that took root in the Crystal River were passed along the Hopewells before AD 1. Mound Builders of Ancient America, page 286 to 87 by Robert Silverberg. We may recall our discussion of the Egyptian mythology in chapter three, that the four sons of Horus were represented and standing at the four cardinal points of the celestial sphere holding up the heavens. And their names were Asmet, Hapi, Tefnu, and Geshit. The same symbolism was prevalent in pre-Columbian America. In discussing the ancient Mayan religious rites, Dr. Paul Rating points out an important of the two four gods of the cardinal points. The earth was held in place by four deities, the four cardinal points, which each cardinal point was associated with an infinite point. If it was, excuse me, each cardinal point was associated with an infinite color. It was difficult to overestimate the significance of these deities. Indians' ceremonialism, which is unthinkable without them. The story of the American Indian, page 66, by Paul Redin. These gods were known as the four bakus because their similar color was yellow, white, black, and red. And their names were respectively Khan, Mulan, X, and Kakan. The symbolism, almost identical in form, prevailing among the Aztecs, where the compasses, the point divinities were known as the four sky bearers. The accurate description of this scheme given by Lewis Pinter as follows. The Mexicans were divided the universe in four regions governed by four gods who were supposed to uphold the skies in the four directions of the compass. These compass directions were associated with various colors, red, white, black, yellow. These sky bears are supposed to be the spirits of the gods, spirits or gods of the stars. They usually symbolized by insects, particularly scorpions, spiders, and bees. And they were associated with only four days on the calendar, which begin with Octilin, Tepe, Cale, and Cotillin. The Religion of Ancient Mexico, page 48, by Louis Spencer. Dr. Churchworth claims that the four god complex may have been traced directly back to the four sons of horrors of the Egyptian pantheon. The same symbolism is found in West Africa. The people of Bale, Beni, and Yoruba, West Africa, said Torchworth, had the same, under, have the, under the same name of 
Auburn Random, Daddy, and Overcon and Obeezy. But these names were the God of Effie, the son of God, i.e. Horus, into the walls of the mosque in their homes and the signs in, the, in their houses. The signs assemble Peronium Man, page 320 by Albert Churchworth. It is necessary to say something about these strange calendar systems to ancient America since it's ultimately of Olmec origin and contain African elements. The construction of, very accurate, of a very accurate calendar complex must be credited to the ancient Maya. This system of time measurement is passed on to the Zeppas and the Aztecs, where we find an operation of somewhat simplified form. The Aztec calendar, like the Aztecs of Mexico, the Mayan calendar, like the Aztecs of Mexico and the Inca of Peru, was based on a lunar year, starting with a lunar year of 12 months and 30 days each. The Mayan astronomers later introduced a sacred calendar called the Token, which made up of 13 months, consisting of 20 days, and a making a total of 260 days for an entire year. This token calendar, which is called by the Tomans, uh, by, called the Tomans by the Aztecs, was made up of a series of 20 days signed combined with the numbers 1 to 13. In the words of Professor Hibbert J. Spence, these series involved upon it, revolved around each other like two wheels, and one with 13 and the other with 20 clogs. The similar wheels are the numbers that make 20 revolutions, while larger wheels of the day is there and making 13 revolutions. And after a number of clogs and a number and a name clogs with which the experiment began, and again in combinations, thus a day with the same number and the same name occurs 13 times 20 or 260 days. The Mayan people possess another color calendar called Habab, which consists of 18 months and of 20 days each, giving a total of 360 days. To this were added five days called Yoruba, which corrected the year to its true length, 365. The actual year, about 365 days and six hours long. Robert Silverstein notes that the Mayans were aware of this and periodically adjusted their calendar to account for this just as we do with leap years. But the Mayan calendar, even more precise than ours, by a matter of some seconds a year. Lost Cities and Vanished Civilizations, page 120 to 121 by Robert Silversberg. <clears throat> These two calendars, the token and the about, were combined to form a third calendar called the calendar round. Now the calendar round, as Professor Ray in this plane, is a rhyme to remembering that the date of numbers associated with the dates Names, dates, entering the ritual year of 260 days can run the whole gauntlet of 13 changes. As a result, a particular day with a particular number can occupy a particular month position every 13 times 4 or 52 years. That's about 18,980 days. In this period, the Maya is called the round calendar of its or its vast important among the Maya and the Aztec in connection with astronomy and their ceremonial life. The Story of the American Indian, page 74 by Paul Radin. The Maya calendar makers were not satisfied with the token of Harbi calendars. They showed their profound knowledge of astronomy by constructing a Venus calendar. This calendar, based on the phases of the planet Venus, which consisted of a year, consisted of 584 days, was divided into four parts, consisting of 236 days, morning star, 90 days, super conjunction, 250 days, evening star, and 90 days, inferior conjunction, which is mathematically accurate. <clears throat> The equivalent of the length of the eight solar years of 365 days each and the five Venus years of 548 days each was recognized accurately calculated. And we have reason to believe that the discrepancy of the 800 eighths or 0 0.08 of a day between Venus year and a true Venus year was corrected by a marginal subtraction of two days after a period of 25 resolutions around that planet. The Vazepa used a ritual calendar of 265, 260 days, which was probably derived from the Mayas. In addition, they connected with the astronomical, astronomical symbolism of their sky god with a reference of the four cardinal points. In one of the codices, Dr. Radin, they represent the following. The first, the east, which is represented by a helmet, man, with a helmet mask and an alligator head. <clears throat> he is good and a fruitful deity. The second, the north, has a mask and a death head which signifies drought and death. The third, the west, were a head of an unknown animal. The fourth figurine, the south, wears a vulture head. And the fifth figurine represents the center. His colors are all those of the god of night heaven and twilight, and the symbols accompanying him refer to war. 
The Story of an American Indian, page 158, by Paul Radin. <clears throat> These go to the sky builders described in the above citation resemble the former cops in the Maya. Opposite of page 266 in volume three of African Discovery of America is a copy of the Mayan drawing and label head of the plate of a car. Professor Leon Weiner compares this plate to an Arabic talisman, uh, to an Arabic talisman known as the Gada. The Gada seemed to mean other things, a vertical column, a zodiac table, and a talisman for the science written in the column, says the professor. To us, the most important interesting Gada is the one that is the basis of the plate of the Bacabs in Central America. Like the one that consists of the central circle with four radiating demi diagonals from the square, from the square surrounding it. The form is identical in a general way with the American plate, but the American plate belongs to a more complicated Gawas. There are no means to ascertain whether the Mandingos possessed the Gawas from the, which the American plate in the likelihood was, was produced. Since nothing of documentation, documentary inquiring has come down to us. But since we have ample documentary evidence to prove that American plate has gone through a Mandingo reaction. <clears throat> in the first place, the center square contains the Mandingo tutelary god with his attributes and attributions. The numeral calculation based on 20 and 13, which is the essence of the American calendar, is surely built on American models. For astrological purpose, they have been used as the division of the, of, the, of the zodiac in the 13 parts which have been found on one of 12 kiboshes in Western Africa. And the curious fact that the similar divisions from the, into the 13 recorded only among the countries in, in America. Precisely such kiddos have been found in the region of the Mandingos. And that the glyphs that bear an amazing resemblance to the Central American glyphs, especially those of the Tacula sculpture, statuette, which have been similarly signed and christened in squares and polygrams. Unfortunately, we only possess the three photographs of the African inscription which Dana Plass had reproduced. Most of the columns in the two were began with the forms of an animal, a spider, and a lizard, which is identical throughout the columns. The spider is identical in the form, which is one is given on the Mound Builder's Gorget, which across the center indicates it's related to the tournaments of the Mexico, Mexicans and the Maya calendar. <clears throat> in Africa, the spider is connected with enormous numbers of tails, including the Hasa, the rainbow, which is called Bangun Gizzle, literally the spider's bow, which indicates the relation to the divinities came down from heaven and bared to the spider. In some places in Africa, the scorpion has taken place of the spider, as the spider is connected with the rainbow and connects it with heaven and earth. And the spirits of heaven and the stars and constellations are thus brought in contact with the spider. Hence, when it's only natural, that's the Gundal, which deals with the astronomy and astrology, and connected to the spider. For this reason, the spiders of the mountain bitters in its middle, the cross, which is a simple representation of the fourfold division of the guana. This ornamentation is in constant use in the Western Sudan. It forms a central design of circular objects which done in square patterns and loops exactly as a bird guard on in mountain builders gorget. In mountain builders gorget, we have not only a spider with a guard on, but a loop ended guard on with a cross in the middle all placed with a circle, and it's a striking object found in the mound. That we have in these cases developed a development of a simple location of the grotto from the Mondingo Dyson, the trigger god of rain and river, who lives upon a tree and is brought about by a number of cases, which each of the square has a representation of a bird head. Africa and Discovery of America, volume 3, 269 to 73, by Leo Weiner. <laughs> After careful study and much other evidence of the African influence of pre-Columbian America, Professor Weiner expressed the following conclusion. The identity of the spiritual civilizations down to the min minutest detail in the Sudan and in Mexico and elsewhere in the Americas leads to the assumption that cultural elements identical in both continents are frequently bear the same in our, our African origin. This preeminently the case of cotton in which America, in which in Africa has a religious purification significance and a presence of which America before Columbus, outside of religions, uses connection with his burials, cannot be proved from the documentary evidence. I bid, same um, page, Africa and Discovery of America, page 369. Among the greatest gold charter was Abu Mbata, 14th century, a native of Morocco who traveled over a period of 30 years. He visited Russia, Egypt, Palestine, Syria, Asia Minor, China, Byzantine, India, the Malay Peninsula, Borno, 
Sumatra, Java, and the Sudan and Arabia. He journeyed far enough north from Russia to see the midnight sun and made four pilgrimage to Mecca's visit Constantinople, across Africa from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea twice. Traveled through the perilous pass in the Hindu Kush Mountains, and finally he wrote the most fascinating of all travel books. Abu Banta, who was born in 1303, started his career on the center of travel at his youth. By the year 1349, he was back in Fez to capital Morocco on the Maronite dynasty, where he decided to settle down and take respite from his wanderings. The reigning monarch at the time was Abu el Abin. <clears throat> Abba Mata regarded the administration of the sovereign and the conditions of the living in the kingdom as worthy as his praise, as sentiments of the times conveyed by the modern commentator follows. For reason which sets forth at least, his judgment was convinced that the noble's country over which his sovereign had ruled was the best country and the best administrator of all those he had visited. He had found the conditions of life better than any other country. Food was more plentiful, barely, variety, and cheap. Life and property was well secure. Law was milder. Justice was assured, charity was fully organized, religion was truly maintained, and literature, science, art, and more honored than any other center of civilization. He mentioned in regards to the organizing charities of that country, the free hospital was constructed and endowed in every king town in the kingdom. As regard to a dominant of science and literature, he described the great college of Fez as having no parallel in the known world for size, beauty, and magnificence. He speaks of the deep interest in tech by the sovereign in all things related to science and literature, and very considerable literary and very achievements of the sovereign himself. <clears throat> all the generous protection which he gave to all people were devoted truly to science. Lady Lugar, A Tropical Dependency, page 774 to 75. At the court of Abu Hansen, El Hansen, there was much talk of the glories of the Mali Empire on the other side of the Great Desert. Being a born chaplain, Abba Benta decided to pay a visit to Mali. So on February 18th, 1352, he crossed the border of Morocco and headed south to Mali. This journey, which occupied upwards up to 18 months at a time, was terminated on December 1353 when he returned to Morocco. The Moorish traveler crossed the frontier of Mali into the city of Watata, which had been the capital of the old kingdom of Ghana. Through the climate of, <clears throat> of Wakata was exceedingly hot, and Baba Benta was fairly impressed on his visit to the city, there was an ambulance of food stuff, and the citizens were attractively attired in clothing imported cheaply from Egypt. Another pleasing feature of the city of Watata was the outstanding beauty of his women, whom Abba Tata regarded as superior to the men. Some of the customs seemed to be to the visitors seen one eye, especially their habits of tracing kinship through the female line through a maternal uncle. And an inheritance passing not from father to son, but from father to son's sister. This practice is quite often common in the Sudan, but Bana recorded is the only other place he had came across this custom was in the habits of Marpar in India. From Matala to Nina, the capital of Mali, was a journey of 20 days. The country is well supplied with trees, along with highway villages of numerous or newer numerous. Traveling was safe, good food was plentiful, and among the trees bearing fruit, the travelers noticed resembling plums, apples, peaches, apricots, but nothing quite like them. Anything needed for the journey can be purchased for a roadside village. Abambata reached near the time and attended to the ceremony at the end of the fast of Ramadan. The main feature to celebrate was presenting the arms to the Sultan, squires. Squires presented to their rulers arms of magnificence. They were in the words of Bantu, swords of ornaments in gold, with scar bags of precious metal, spears of gold and silver, quivers made of gold, and clubs made of crystal. The following by dramatic performances with fencing, dancing, gymnastics, and the reciting of a cosmic poetry, including which the Moor the Moors visitor rate very fine. Lady Lugard devotes an entire chapter to the adventures of Abunada and Mali. One of the features of this adventure attached to the attention of Lady Lugard was the fact that some of the customs in Mali in the 14th century were almost identical to those of contemporary Aztecs in Mexico. In her words, Poets wearing masks, dressed up like birds, were allowed to speak their opinions to the monarch. Amanada states that this practice was common, this practice, this practice was a great iniquity and a long period in the introduction of Islam among these people. The description which he gave in some details can hardly fall to re recall the similar practice inherited from the Timans of the Aztecs, who 
And then in the same latitude of the American continent, we were at this very moment in the middle 14th century, making good of their position on the Mexican plateau. They had other customs which corresponded to these Sudanese. The Aztec crown, which is transmitted like that of Mali in collateral consent, both in, king, in, in both kingdoms, exception to the rule. The practice of keeping the son to the subject apprentice is sort of an honorable hostage of the court of the monarch was perhaps too general to be worthy of special note, although it was common to the two people. The more terrible custom of appropriating the gods for human sacrifice, which also essentially practiced by the Aztecs, which will be dis we remember, which which was excuse me, which was so essentially practiced by the Aztec, was it to be remembered? Only the other day brought it in by British ruling Benin. It's probably still practiced in less portion of the pagan belt. The custom of wearing a head as an animal as a headdress, which also common to the Aztecs, were preserved amongst the pagan and West African coasts at the time of the first occupation of the Gold Coast by the Portuguese in 1481. A Tropical Dependency, page 137 to 139, by Lady Lugard. The common features, the comment of the certain African and American Indian Moors in the 14th century seemed to Lady Lugard to be an odd coincidence. She certainly would have dismissed this absurd idea if any actual contact between the two peoples dwelling on opposite side of the Atlantic. But truth is sometimes stranger than fancy. For we know that the ancestors of the Medica people were sending traders and perhaps colonists to Americas many centuries before Columbus. The idea that the Africans were in a new world 3,000 years ago is hard for many people to believe, even among the educated classes for old stereotypes die hard. But there is no lack of evidence in this respect. J.A. Rogers, shout out to J.A. Rogers, the great ancestor, J.A. Rogers, and Africa's gift to America, cites Latin American scholars on American influence in America. For example, C.C. Marquez is quoted saying, the Negro type is the most frequent ancient Mexican sculpture. Negroes frequently in most remote conditions, traditions, from American historian, from Mexican historian Ravel Plaza, we have the following. It is indisputable that in ancient times, the Negro race occupied our territory, Mexico. The Mexicans called the uh, Negro God Alexander, which means black face. We also have testimony from Nicholas Leon, who declares that the, the almost extinction of the original Negroes during the time of the Spanish conquest and the memories of them in the most ancient traditions induces the belief that the Negroes were the first inhabitants of Mexico. The presence of the African substratum in the religious system of the ancient Americas is undeniable. It has been noticed by a careful observer, Colonel Browning, that said some of the statues of the Indian gods in Central Americas possess Negro features and certain prehistoric statues are undoubtedly represented Negroes. For instance, such statues in Tijuana and Pelé in a giant Negro head curves in the granite near Mexico volcano of Tilamantan. The Shadow of Atlantis, page 40. This African religious influence had a profound effect on the Mayan people and in the center still cherish old traditions even to the present day. We may choose the Mayan for their illustrative purposes since they are among the greatest of American Indian cultures. And we may draw upon the expert testimony of a field archaeologist of high authority. We refer to A. Hyatt Vermeil of the Museum of American Indian, the high foundation of New York City. Mr. Vermeil has through knowledge of certain customs and language of the Latin American of the Indians in Latin America. He has traveled and lived among the descendants of the ancient Mayans for many years. His account of their origins and rights, his account of their origins and rights, has account of religious rights is of special value, informing and grossly study of American Indian civilizations. We quote the following. The great cities of the Mayan empire were deserted. Many were completely lost and hidden in rank jungles and forces of the tropics, and existing Indians had little more than vague traditions and legends regarding their origin and in their past year and in their past. Yet they worshiped their old gods using the temples for a ceremony wherein the chamans or the priests performed the rites. Even today, many Indians of Central and South America secretly venerate or worship the gods of their forefathers. The Mayan tribes are no exception, although often the ancient Mayan deities and rites of the Christian rituals and saints are almost inextricably infused. And at a little church in Santa at Espinanas, Guatemala, is an image of a black Christ to which thousands of Indians journey annually to all parts of Central America, even from Mexico and South America. The spot has become a shrine or a mecca for the Indians. For hundreds 
or even thousands of miles, they travel to a score, this is a score, Guatemala can visit to carry with them all their possessions in order to have them sanctified at the famous church. To all outward intents, the purpose that they are Christians making a pilgrimage to a Christian church in order to worship before a figure of Christ. No doubt, many of, if not all, most of them, actually are sincere and believers of this cause. But as a matter of fact, the underlying cause, the real urge which led them to this spot of the inner and central faith in their ancient gods and religion. The very fact that the image of a black man has a symbolic, uh, symbolic significance, which can be traced directly to the ancient religious and mythologies, and deeper, divulging deep, deeper into the details of the annual pilgrimage and swine, shrine, we find evidence of the observance of the Mayan religious numerous. The Indians who care for the church and the image of the Mayan priest clan or caste, many of the ceremonies, rituals, and festivals of the pilgrims are obvious of ancient Mayan origin. The little samanto, or images of the devout Indians married to the church to be sanctified with sirs as their own household goods are figures of ancient Indian deities. Moreover, among many of the Indians, the black Christ is considered to be private as Ashrancha or as Humbubu, the former the Mayan god of merchant, husbandman, and travelers, the latter the god, father, or supreme deity of the Mayans, often prefixed with the Spanish Christo, Christ as crystal instrument or crystal haboom. Old Civilizations of the New World, page 143 to 146 by A.H. White Vermeule. This is an essential literature dealing with the lost continent of Atlantis and all sources of that story told by Plato. We are not concerned whether Atlantis actually exists or not, but Plato accounts should be noticed. For certain information which conveys on the antiquity of, of, the, of the civilization both in the old and new worlds. The, an illuminating discussion on this matter is contained in Rudolf Malowski's article on Atlantis. He writes the following. Crisco, in whose name Plato tells, the narrative says that when he was a boy, he heard of a flourishing country of Atlantis and from the non nigerian grandfather who had in turn heard about it from his friend Solon, the famous Athenian lawgiver. Solon got the story from an Egyptian priest who had access to ancient temple chronicles and having met him in his wandering in Egypt. The story made a rather long journey, but in spite of that, an authentic ring about it. There is nothing to indicate there is a produced product of somebody's fancy. It contains details that Plato's sources cannot have invented. Over the, few first, over the past few years, archaeological excavations have brought to light that the Hellenic culture was preceded by the Aegean culture in mighty states. The ancient groups knew nothing of this. Yet Plato began his story about Atlantis with a description of powerful states that preceded Hellenists. He even gives a layout of the map of, of the capital of Atlantis, which duplicates the layout of Tlalhuacan, the Aztec capital, and now the present site of Mexico City. The entire story is told by Plato, woven by similar con con consequences. Similar coincidence. There is an astonishing coincidence and the chronological of the ancient Egyptians and the Syrians was the same as that as the ancient Mayans in America. Can we assume they knew about each other? We have no grounds for that. But we even make an assumption it would not, it would not explain why they selected the same date in which they began their kind of time. Only, our only other conjecture is the concurrence of the calendar in three by, of three different people is due to some sacred event known to them. An event that could be ha, only could be sting to have marked the end or the beginnings of the world. It is probably wise retaining in the memory of these people for thousands of years. The Egyptians and the Syrians give an exact date of 11,542 BC. This is the approximate date on the chronology of the Mayas, also begins. On the distracted discovery, page 174 to 76. The year 11,542 BC seems to be important in the annals of ancient astronomy, and it lies much focus on the point by Professor Julius Opper in a paper read in the scientific meeting in Brussels in 1868. The title of discourse was La Biblical Fixed Prayers Inscriptions Pian Forms. The paper was published in Paris in the same year, 1868. There is no English translation of this paper, but the key points are summarized by Ennis Donnelly in his famous book, Atlantis, published in 1882, from which account we cite the following papers. M. Opera read a paper at Brussels Congress to show that the astronomical observation of the Egyptians and the Syrians that 
before the era of man existed on earth at such a stage of civilization as to be taken under a note of astronomical phenomenon and calculate the considerable length accuracy of the length of the year. The Egyptians say the calculation of by cycles of 1,460 years, zodiac cycles, as they were called. Their year consisted of 365 days, which caused them to lose one day every four solar years, and consequently they would attain their original starting point again only after 4, 1,460 years, or 365 times four. Therefore, the zodiac cycle ending at the year 139 of our era commenced in that year of 1312, 1322 BC. On the other hand, the Syrian cycle was, was 1805 of that year, or 22,325 lunar nations. As the Assyrian cycle began at began 712 BC, the Chaldean state between the Dulge and the Dulge in their first historical dynasty was a period of 39,180 years. Now, what is meant this number? It stands for 12 Egyptian zodiac cycles plus the 12 Assyrian, Assyrian lunar cycles. 12 times 1,460 equals 17,520, and 12 times 1,805 equals 21,660, excuse me, 21,660, which equals 39,180. These two modes of calculating time were in agreement with each other and were known simultaneously to one people, the Chaldeans. Let us now build up a series of both cycles starting from our era and the results as follow. The Zodiac cycle, 1460, the lunar cycle, 1805, the Zodiac cycle, 1300, well, I'm not gonna read all that, because you know what I'm saying. At the year 1150, at the year of 11,542 BC, the two cycles came together and consequently had a year in common origin in one. In the same astrological observation, Atlantis, page 120, page 26 to 27, by Ines and If these dates seem excessive, we can check them from a reliable source. When Herodotus was in Egypt in the fifth century BC, he visited the temple of Amun Ra in Thebes. The scholarly priest of that establishment gave the father of history a summary of the dynamic history of Egypt in the official records. In the words of Herodotus, the priest said that Menes was the first king of Egypt. Next, they read me from a papyrus the names of 330 monarchs whom they said were in succession upon the throne. The history of Herodotus, page 113. When Herodotus studied the data given to him by the priest, he counted 341 generations of Egyptian royalty. Now, and gives the following estimate of time span to follow. Now, 300 generations of man make 10,000 years. Egypt, three generations fill up a century. And the remaining 41 makes 13, 1,013, excuse me, 1,340. Thus, the whole number of years is 11,340. Page 131 of Herod, the history of Herodotus. If ancient civilizations in Africa, Asia, and America knew certain traits pointing to a current time and origin in times of remote past, and the civilization is much older than many modern authorities are willing to admit. In our opinion, we have represented some of the data in chapters two and three of this work, that all early civilizations were African Ethiopian origins. Let me read that again. It is our opinion that we have presented some of the data in chapter two and chapter three of this work, that all early civilizations was African Ethiopian origin. If these ancient Kushites could be found such cultures as those in Egypt and Sumter, there is no reason they could not sail across the Atlantic and planted seeds in the first civilization of the New World. When the history of the Negro land comes to be written in detail, declares Lady Lugard, it may be found that the kingdoms lying toward the eastern end of the Sudan were the home of races who inspired rather than races who received traditions of civilization associated with for us with the name of ancient Egypt. When they covered either side of the upper Nile, between the latitudes of 10 degrees and 7 degrees territories, in which they found monuments more ancient than the oldest e Egyptian monuments. If this should prove, if this should prove to be the case, that in the civilized days we were forced to recognize that black people are the fount of the original enlightenment, and it may happen that we have, we have to reverse our entire view of black races and regard those who now exist in the decadence or represent almost a forgotten era rather than an embryonic possibility of an era yet to come. 
Tropical Dependency, page 17 through 18 by Lady Lugarn. And there you have it. You know what I'm saying? I'll read this little part right here. You know what I'm saying? In chapter five, excuse me, chapter six, we cite Basil Davidson as referring to Maximus' plan to the mariners of Mali Empire embarking on voyages to the New World as a tall story, perhaps. We are now pleased to inform the reader that Mr. Davidson has changed his mind. In a magazine, West Africa, for Sunday, Saturday, June 7, 1969, there's an article by Basil Davidson entitled Africans Before Columbus. We are told by Mr. Davidson that Columbus and early European arrivals in the Americas came back with quite a bit of evidence suggesting, but inconclusive, that black people from Africa had already reached these shores. Various writers have planned from time to time over the past 20 years or more to likely West African origins of these black explorers. Most notably, the tribe of the Alamays was said to have settled in Honduras, right? They still exist to this day. The tribe of the Alamays still exists to this day in Honduras. Then of course, to cite Davidson again, there's the famous conversation of the 1324, with 1324 to 1305 on a transatlantic voyage between Emperor Musa Mali, 1312 to 1337, and the current scholar known as Abin Amr Habi, recorded in return by Abu Ari, Abu Omari, a few years later in his Mas Abu Amr Sam. A of the conversation between Mansa Musa and Abu Hajab is given by Mr. Davidson as follows. I asked Sultan Mansa Musa how he came to power in his hands. We are, he told me, a house of transmit power by heritage. The ruler who preceded me, probably Mansa Musa Muhammad, would not believe that this is impossible to discover the limits of the neighboring sea, i.e. the Mali Empire's western and southeastern the Atlantic. He wanted to find out and persisted in his plan. He had 200 ships filled with men and other filled with gold, water, and supplies, sufficiently quantity to last for two for years. He told them, and those who commanded them, return only after you reach the extremity of the ocean or we exhausted your food and water. They went away. Their absence was long before any of them returned. Finally, a single ship appeared. It reappeared, and we asked the captain about their adventures. Prince replied, we sailed for a long time up to the moment, and when we encountered a mid-ocean or something like a river with a violent current. My ship was last. The others shelled on. And gradually, as East Loom Center in this place, they disappeared and did not come back. We didn't know what happened to them. As for me, I returned to where I was and did not enter that current. But the emperor, Muhammad, did not want to believe him. He equipped the 2,000 vessels and 1,000 for himself and 1,000 for water supplies. He conferred power on me, Manta Musa, and left me with his companions on the, left with his companions on the ocean. This is the last time I saw him and the others. I maintain an absolute mastery of the empire. Now it seems very probable indeed, Basil comments that Musa, that Musa said to this Alamari who told Alamari, a very capable analyst whose information about Mali rested on eyewitness accounts by Egyptian scholars who sojourned there. Continuing his speculation on the topic, Davidson observes, quote, those who believe the sailors of Mali did not, did, those who believe that the sailors of Mali did in fact reach the Americas have evidence to abuse. They pointed that ships sailing west of Senegal to pass Cape Verde a little north latitude 10 degrees north. In doing so, they would sail directly to the west of flowing equatorial currents and hence the Aquinas currents as far as the Gulf of Mexico. As they recalled that Columbus on his third voyage had information from Cape Verde Islands that canoes had been found which started from the coast of Guinea and navigated west with merchandise. In the view that Mansa Muhammad experienced was a figment of Mansa Musa's imagination, or that if they really did take place, they altogether failed to reach the Americas, had thus overlooked a great many bits of uh, pieces of evidence to the contrary. This evidence has largely been sat on by historians. One cannot help feeling because of this inadvertent preconception, a preconception about the infallibility of Africans to navigate the sea. Medieval Mali was no mere post of the civilized world in those times. On the contrary, it was in touch with the Eastern world of Islam, who many travelers and learned men, and the Eastern world of Islam was very familiar with the sea. Traveling was very much in the spirit of West Africa. Thus, and then as later, and if it by land, why not by sea? West African number 2714, Saturday, June 7, 1969. So when you say that you know, a, so there it goes from John G. Jackson. 
the great historian John G. Jackson. So when you say that, you know, well, we're not, we're, we're native to this land. This right here blow this out the water. It's well cited, cited by black authors, you know what I'm saying, African Discovery of America. You can see by the pictures those are African people stay and um doing African religion and all type of stuff like that. Doing African religion and all type of stuff like that. So this is from you know the great historian John G. Jackson, like I said before. It's kind of hard to diss that work. This is scholarship, you know what I'm saying? So when you say we're Native Americans, no, 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 no. Well, we beat it, we beat them here a long time ago. I agree to that. We probably we had colonies and all type of stuff like that. But as you said, they only named two Negro, original Negro tribes. That was the Samaka and the Alamaze. The Alamaze in Honduras and the Samaka is in um, Guyana. It's a video. I got a video on the Samaka that I'm going to put it in this post too. You know what I'm saying? As is one of the featured videos. You can check out that video I did on that stuff too. So when these cats come out, well, we're, we're, we're originally from here. No, you're not. You know what I'm saying? It shows that we floated boats. Don't come when we know Pangea bullshit. Stop with that. Cut that bullshit on out the game. You know what I'm saying? This work, even though it's back from the 60s and stuff like that, 60s and 70s, it will still stand. The sites are good. You know what I'm saying? Lady Lugard, um, all the stuff you can look up in here. You go through the video. You can look all these sites up. There's nothing you can do about it. Herodotus. I ain't got to other Greek historians like Dorsio Ciceris and stuff like that that tell you about how they throwing boats back and forth then, you know, the Phoenicians and stuff like that. So stop, man. Cut, cut out the BS, man. It's just a hate of going, trying to have a disconnect of being African. Some of them cats, man, I'm starting to wonder in the so-called Aboriginal community. Now, this is an easy read and it's an easy lookup. You know, I kind of, you know, have some finally some words. It's an easy read, easy lookup. You can easily look this stuff up and come back and say, yeah, and look around and say, yeah, this is right. But we're going to keep on going. I'm not going to stop. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to show more African scholars. You know what I'm saying? From over here and from over there. You know, Shea Kennedy, I'm just George G. Jackson, W. E. Du Bois. You know, I'm going to show more African scholars that say, yeah, we was over here, but we're African. None of this, none of this Native American ass BS that y'all talking about now. Even the whole culture, if you look at it, like they broke it down, the culture is African. You know what I'm saying? You ask, ask some of these original cats, what was they worshiping? Oh, we don't know. They done told you. John G. Jackson told you what they was worshiping. He broke that shit down. They was worshiping the African culture. And if y'all want me to, I'll break it down with white folks saying the same thing. From the east of the Mississippi on back, they was worshiping the African culture. Miss me with your fuck shit. Stop with the self-hatred and don't love Africa. We love Africa over here. Stop with that madness. It's a Coast Gift Fun Day and I'm out. Peace.